There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Welcome to another Word in Your Attic and to uh, a music writer and a broadcaster who we devotedly follow on Twitter. Uh, recent posts have included um, a picture of Probe Records in Liverpool, simply captioned My Church, and the news that the record now playing was King Jammy's dis King Jammy Destroys the Virus with Dub, which, I mean, I think that's precisely what the world needs more <laughs> Absol of. Right absolutely. Now. Yeah, no, what I, think think? Right. I think you're right. Someone someone pointed out that when I said that Probe was my church, that um, it, was, it was kind of a, it was quite close to sort of a, a sort of Catholic operation with sort of like, punishment and chiding and you know you would you would go in there and you would be judged for your purchase All right yes yeah. well that is the record shop experience a lot of them yeah, it's, it's, really it's a jesuit often. establishment isn't it really yeah, yeah it is sat behind the counter and would pass judgment on what you bought and would refuse <laughs> to serve you if he felt that it fell below his standards Good, yeah yeah <laughs> that, that is just uh, this has been a, a major theme on these things actually. yeah just that general feeling of terrible humiliation that you just didn't come up to the grade. I had, I had literally the opposite happened as well. Cause um, my brother would, I had an older brother and he would, um, he would give me money to go into town on, on a Saturday. It's an incredible gift. And I would, I'd buy, he'd sort of, he'd go through the enemy and he'd sort of say, Oh, can you, can you get us this, you know, and get us this. So I'd have like cash to go into town and go to like Penny Lane and, and, and Probe and Sheverton and all the record shops in Liverpool, but a bit of money to spend like, on myself and get, it wasn't to get something for me. It was to get something for him that I thought might be interesting. And there was, so I'd have been about, I'd have been about 13 and I went into Probe to, to sort of get stuff. And I, I um, and I picked up a copy of, of this. All right. So well, there we go. <laughs> And and so um, I went up to the counter and, and uh, Jeff Davis, the boss of Probe, was, was serving behind the counter. And sort of, you know, I get I forget what else I would have got. And I went I sort of pushed this forward. Oh, we can have can I have a hop of this, please. Um, and he and he leaned forward. He went, Sam, how old are you, lad? And I said, well, you are. And he said, how old are you, lad? I said, I'm 13. And he, and he said, and he shouted, he literally stopped the show. He shouted, there's a lad here, there's a lad here, 13. And he's just bought the best record that anyone will buy today. <laughs> uh, that was a clear spot. And uh, so that was kind of simultaneously terrifying and absolutely fantastic. You know, that <laughs> that you, at the age of 13, you would you would crossed over into the hallowed world of buying an accepted record in pro. That you wouldn't be allowed to to to, to buy it because you were too young or something. I mean, is that yeah, well, I mean, I think just just that sense that kind of I didn't don't think you could quite believe that some you know, even in Liverpool, some little 30, I mean, I, I don't, I wasn't a very old looking 13, so I'd have looked probably a bit younger. I'd have probably looked about yeah, yeah. nine or something. I think he, I don't think he quite believed that this little, you know, kid had walked in and picked up a copy of Clear Spot. So where did you grow up then? I, I grew, well, I was born in Liverpool and I grew up on the Wirral and Eastham on the Wirral. So, um, so my, my, my family were from Liverpool. My dad was from Birkenhead. My mum was from Liverpool. My, and my brother and my sister are much older than me. I'm the youngest in the family. They all grew up in Liverpool. And then when the... the, the so you grew up in a house with lots of... Old, I'd done the same thing. I had three older sisters. So you just heard all sorts of music that was uh, that was kind of before your time. It was really interesting, actually. Well, absolutely. I mean, I... Because, you know, on a, on a couple of these, you you, you know, because you obviously ask people, like, what was the first single they bought? And yeah. And like, sort of, you know, six or seven or eight when they bought their first single. And I grew up listening to my brother's record collection so didn't buy my first single for ages and the stuff that I was listening to and all like my peers were listening to first it would have been glam but then it would have been stuff like you know blondie and things like that and I was sat at home listening to I mean I liked I liked story records so I'd be sat at home listening to <laughs> Gordon Lightfoot singing the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Oh, really? oh, very good. Or, very or, good. Um, I, you know, I, 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 hang on, I'll do, I'll do one out as well. Because <laughs> another of my favourite records as, as a kid would have been, um, oh, come on, where is it? Typically, it's not. The ah, wreck of the Edmund have, Fitzgerald. Would have been this because, oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah fantastic. It would, have been, it would have been Tam Lynn and. Um, 
and Matty Groves because they were the story songs. So it's yeah. simple with that, you know, at the top of the, the, the room at the back of the house where the stereo was. <laughs> and I'd sit there with the headphones on and listen to these songs because they were like people telling me stories. So I'd listen to Tamlin and I'd listen to the record. Of the They'd have a win- they had winners and losers, didn't they? Those, uh, yeah. the, those records. They Absolutely. Had yeah. yeah. That was, that's exactly what it was. It was like kind of... Um, they were like fairy stories, you yeah. know, kind of they were kind of the audible of their day for me, you know. Right, right. And also slightly macabre and yeah. uh, oh, very, I'm very like, much yes. very, very well, dreadful apparently. things happen to people. Sex and violence, basically. Yeah. Sex and violence <laughs> and uh, poor women who'd got into the family way. Oh, it's, it was yeah. ghastly stuff. My brother had a reel to reel tape, and uh, they used to um apparently one of the things that I used to do, and I wish I still had the tapes, is like when I went to bed, I would tell myself ghost stories before I went to bed. And my brother, I remember my brother taped them, taped me sort of telling me myself these ghost stories about skeletons and ghosts and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I obviously was a very macabre kid, and I don't know whether it was anything to do with uh, listening, to, listening to Fairport Convention. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So when did you, so you inherited that from uh, elder, elder siblings. I mean, when did you kind of strike out on your own, so to speak? It would have been, it would have been the Smiths and it would have been before that. And because I had a very strict mum and like kind of, because I'm, you know, there were certain things that weren't allowed in the house. And my brother, because he was older, I think he was allowed to buy kind of, you know, records that might have swearing in them. Because I remember he bought, brought home a copy of, of new boots and panties. Oh, and oh no, Lord, there's an opening me, track. On told that. me that I yeah. was not allowed to listen to this. Well, there you go. Yeah, Don't yeah. leave it on its own in the room. That's well, amazing. exactly. And so when everyone was out, I remember listening to New Boots and Panties. And I don't, I, you know, I don't know whether. Is it Plasto Patricia that has. Oh, the, yeah, I think it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. it is. I don't know whether I've kind of gone through it and kind of missed. The, the start of Plasto Patricia. Yeah, it could easily have done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I was uncertain as to what was the filth contained in this record, you know. But the, the point of the story being that um, I bought a copy. Of the first real single I would have bought would have been, um, is, which is quite late when you think about it, was We Don't Need This Fascist Brew Thing by... All right. Um, by Heaven 17. And um, and I brought it home and I told my brother that I borrowed it off a friend because I didn't want to be because there was a and it was like and I said I'm not sure I should I should listen to this house in the in the house in case mom finds out because there's a rude word on it and he said what's the rude word and I said well can I say it and he said yeah come on it's like your mom's not here say the rude word and I said ass don't just sit there on your ass and i was terrified that if i played this and it got heard that i might be you know reprimanded by my mom so which is i mean so it's ridiculous now but that's kind of what it was so yeah it, uh, it was it wasn't until i was a teenager and um, brought home um this charming man on 12 inch that fir- that counts as the first real right single just to I- go back to new birds and pennies for a second it is amazing to reflect on the fact that that record was a huge commercial success, which means every house in the country that bought records <laughs> had that record. And had exactly I, the same conversation. As, it was yeah. sold in Smiths. It was sold in Boots. Yeah. I don't remember a sticker or anything other from no, the there wasn't. Ever say. It, 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 there was it, not it, a national it, scandal about it yeah. at all, was there? <laughs> every house had that collection of words in that order exactly <laughs> sitting sitting there uh, get it. And, and yeah and it's before the cd isn't it so it's before you can kind of flick it onto the next <laughs> one you know you have to get up and go across the room wouldn't you to, <laughs> to avoid it how educational it's it was think yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely but it's because like i mean the thing is my my parents world of music because it was it was very much down to my brother that I had an education in music because he he got into Dylan and uh, Neil Young and Simon and Garfunkel all by himself because my mum, mum and dad's collection of records. We were, we were talking about this the other day. They had a collection of sea shanties. Oh, very they good. had uh, an album by well, it's not Liverpool, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, they had an album by the Spinners, not the Detroit Spinners, but the no, Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The double they, had, uh, they, had, yeah. they had the best of the Seekers on MFP. Uh, my dad had a, na- a Box set of Nat King Cole um, oh, lovely. came out. They came out through the World Record Club, which he would have bought. I worked this out. He would. It would have come out just after Nat King Cole died, which and they would have brought it out as this kind of commemorative box yeah, set. Yeah, yeah. 
so he had that as well so all the all the work all the hard work was down to my brother and he he worked um he worked he was a he worked on the docks he was a plumber and he worked on the docks and then he worked at Vauxhall's and he had a pal called Alan who I, I would love to see Alan's collection now because he was massively into all the West Coast stuff and like West Coast psych and but also he was heavily into kind of stuff like you know Bunny Men and Teardrop Explodes and Joy Division. And he would lend my brother all these records and got my brother into like Tom Waits and Towns Van Zandt. So kind of, hang on, have a, have a little... Well, the Bunny Men and the Teardrops were part of that kind of grand West Coast psychedelic tradition in some ways. Absolutely. Yeah, which yeah. and it also very... It an extension of it. Very Liverpool. We're talking about Jeff Davis at Probe. It was Jeff's aim when he opened Probe to basically put a copy of Forever Changes in the hand of every, you know, every record buyer in Liverpool, you know, which is kind of one of the reasons why, you know, kind of that, you know, as people say, oh, you, you, you grew up in Liverpool or the Wirral, you must, you know, you must love the Beatles. And it's not true because, you know, the, the Beatles in terms of partly to do with Beatles, Liverpool's relationship with the Beatles, because they felt very bitter about the Beatles leaving Liverpool but also because of places like Eric's and Probe had a ban on the Beatles. I mean, Eric's never played. <laughs> they actually had a ban. Yeah, they had a ban and, and, and sort of, and also the, it was, you know, and obviously the cavern got knocked down. So the yeah. Liverpool, Liverpool in the seventies and early eighties wasn't sentimental about the Beatles. Not at all. At all. No. You know, when, did, when did the statues start appearing? When did the first Beatles statue appear in, appear in Liverpool? Because now you can't know. move for them. Yeah, I don't know, because, I mean, the Beatles shop, which was opposite Probe, kind yes, of opened in, I think, the early 80s. And that had a yeah. massive effect because then they started to do the tours. Because that's post John Lennon dying, isn't it? Probably... Yeah. Yeah. But you were still you still it was still even then it was still very, you know, because Eric's was open then and it was still very kind of anti, you know, anti Beatles. What was so, the first okay. group you saw? Can you remember? Sorry? What was the first group you saw? Oh, I know the first group I saw was um was was Dire Straits at the Birmingham NEC. Oh, and wow. it's like my 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 scale, my upward scale is quite something because the first group I saw was Dire Straits at the NEC. Then the second How old would you have been? Um, I would have been 14, 13, 14. So what year are we talking about there? We're talking we're talking just after um it's before love over gold so we're talking making okay movies. So making movies that kind yeah. of oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah and then my, my brother took me to see uh curtis mayfield at liverpool university uh, right. so he was that was the second gig and the third was the cramps at the royal court fantastic so all that, right christ that's amazing yeah, so kind of a really peculiar order. Yeah, we and when we went to see uh, Curtis Mayfield, there were literally there would have been about twenty five people there. Yeah, yeah I bet. At yeah. Mount Hall, and including the Christians, the Christians were there, and uh, yes. they, yeah, and they were harmonize like before the show, they were sort of harmonizing up by the bar, which I remember as well. I suppose there's uh, the twenty five people there is probably half the course in those days because. Those kind of legends weren't celebrated in those days, were they? You know what I mean? Yeah, anybody who's a kind of legend nowadays plays anywhere. There's a load of people there because yeah. they've all heard of him. Yeah. Back then, nobody cared. You know, that was when, you know, you know, Marvin Gaye was playing Butlins or whatever. You yes, know? Was, yeah, yeah. Soul, soul especially, was kind of was yeah, yeah. completely unfashionable then. But if you, yeah. also, it was just, it was so much going on in the present tense, wasn't it? If you had a choice between going to see Echo and the Bunny Man or Curtis Mayfield, you'd probably yeah. go and see the Bunny Man. Yeah, that's, that's what, true. Actually. That's what was that's exciting. True. That's what the papers were writing about. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And also, kind of, it would have, you know, even though it was only a few years ago that Curtis Mayfield was at his peak. It would have felt like forever back then. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It yeah. felt like a long time. So you were fascinated by records. Did you go and visit people who had records? Did you, you know, I'm quite interested in this, you know, they, they, did you meet people who had other records and go to their houses and look at their records and um, so forth? Not, not that often. I mean, I was quite a solitary kid, but I did go to, I mean, I went round to... Oh, God, I'm trying to remember his name. Is it? I can't remember. I certainly there were people who had like 
Hawkwind records and Deep Purple and things like that. Right. And, and, and so, and also that the whole, because the whole scene at my school would have been metal as well. It would have, it was totally like heavy metal, which I had no knowledge of and nothing to do with whatsoever. Really? Yeah. So you I never mean, even, you never even heard Deep Purple. Just out of curiosity, or... did you not just put them on? And... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, so you would, can't avoid hearing them if I was playing at school. Where would I have put them on? Because I only had like reference to my brother's record collection. Oh, yeah. right, okay. so, you know, you've got to think that we couldn't kind of go on the internet and go, oh, I'll have a listen. No other course. Yeah, have a listen to a bit of Deep Purple or whatever. So I'd hear, I'd hear like go around to my mate's house and, you know, and they play, play me, you know, Smoke on the Water or we'd listen to I'm a Gummer or something like that, you know. But I think, I mean, the one of the weird things was, I think, it sounds like almost like a cliche for Liverpool. It was like staying over at a friend's house in Liverpool and a copy of Forever Changes lying out, which almost sounds like something, something that is scripted. But they, and, and I remember sort of us putting on this record that we knew nothing about, but it was just sitting out there and just being... I, again, it's so hard to talk about a record like that and not feel like you're talking in cliches because it was like, I hadn't heard anything like this before. You know, and so it was it was a very strange experience to listen to this record. Why did that strike you as particularly fantastic? I felt the same way. I thought it was amazing, actually. It was yeah. part, of the, part of the orchestration and things like that, which yeah. was really unusual at the time. Yeah, and, and especially, yeah, you you don't expect it when it comes in and you don't expect those peculiar little kind of lyrical ticks and everything that he yeah. took in there as well. And there's nothing that I'd heard before that had prepared me for it, you know, even though I think my brother might have had a kind of a discount best of with love. So it would, I would have had signed DC and I would have heard, you know, and more again, but I wouldn't have heard any of the kind of stranger, longer tracks on, on forever changes at all. Did you ever play music? Were you no, in a band? I was ne time? never in a band and never really was inclined to, you know, it was always kind of, music as a, as a consumer I never felt that need to sort of to play an instrument you know beyond sort of school school recorder was about my limit you know right 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 and um yeah it was it was basically um sort of very deep into you know growing up with my brother's music and then going away to university and kind of and it being kind of you know the the smiths and the bunny man and the cure and all that kind of stuff you know, when and did you um, write something. When did you sorry. first? When did you first write about music? Um, that would have been for Select magazine. at college. Oh, really? Select? Yeah. Oh no. How much I, later? Yeah. Would I have? Would I have written anything for? No, because I mean, at college, I went away and I I um, studied film. I did I did media studies and then film, and I was um, and then I taught um, for two years after I did an MA in film at Warwick, and I taught for two years there. And then um, basically was kind of, um, I knew someone who worked on Select Magazine and I was complaining about, you know, not enjoying kind of marking essays and things like that. And I kind of, and we'd been in touch by letter, you know, and you still had sort of epistolatory kind of uh, romance yeah. and everything. And they said, well, look, you can write. I can tell you can write from your letters. Well, who was that? That was Sean Pattenden. Oh yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, we're not, friend, we're not friends now, but we were friends. Yeah. And she and she basically said, "Well, look, you know, you could you could easily write for Select. Just send in send in some reviews and um, and see what they say." And it was it was literally kind of the you know when they did the next issue, like and Andrew Perry kind of came in and said, "Oh, do you want to do some reviews?" And I remember the I think the first album I reviewed was by because they they gave me all the rubbish that no one else. There you go. No, that's that's, we've all been <laughs> through that. Yeah. So it would have been for years in my case. <laughs> it would have been the um. It would You're have been going the through drum, it. The drum club. Do you remember the drum? I, club? I don't even remember the drum club. <laughs> Early kind of you know that wave of kind of dance indie crossover sort of stuff, and um, so it was an album called Drums Are Dangerous by the Drum Club. And you had to put a little bullet point at the end of the review. Right. That's yeah. right. And I remember I put drums are tedious. <laughs> <laughs> so it was you that finished their career. Yeah, yeah. there you go, the bastard. Yeah, you. A certain amount of guilt about that because, I mean, it, it was when you look back on that time, obviously because there was so much music coming out and you could be quite flippant about it. So you can, you do realise how kind of like cruel and waspish you could be. But I was well, talking... You 
yeah. I was I was talking to somebody about Select the other day, and the amazing thing was about it was how you'd be in the studio and they'd say, oh, we've got George Harrison on the phone. Can you do like five minutes with George Harrison for a little box on the reissue of All Things Must Pass? And so you, you basically had this opportunity to interview George Harrison and you just got him on the phone for five minutes. And you go, oh, yeah, what's it like? Um, All Things Must Pass coming out again. You know, can you tell <laughs> Oh, we've got, we're doing this um, Q&A on, um, on hair. Can you say, so, you know, so, and then you yeah, go, oh, that's that's George a list of questions. You were compiling some kind of thing yeah. was it about some attitude, you know, and you just had to tack that question on to every interview. And then years later, you think, bloody hell, I had George Harrison on the phone. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yeah, and, and, and then just kind of went click brewer and, and put it down. But it, it sort of relates to the point I was making about Curtis Mayfield. You know, they, these people were not kind of on mountaintops in those days. You know, no, the means. I mean, I know those two people are dead, you know, but even though in the later life, they became these extraordinary distant figures. Earlier on, they weren't at all. And also, they, they were under a certain amount of pressure to try and connect with, you know, yes. students. Younger sure, you know. people or yeah. whatever. Yeah, like yeah. getting Paul McCartney to, to be interviewed at Smash Hits. You know, he yeah, thought yeah. that was a sensible thing to do. He already had a load of people in their 40s buying his records. What he wanted was a load of people who were 15. Yeah, you know? yeah. 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 Well, it's inc absolutely incredible to think of it now. So now you, I mean, you... you you go around a lot of charity shops, don't you? Is that fair to say? I, mean, I get yeah. that impression from your Twitter. Charity yeah, tell shop. us about the world of somebody who spends a lot of time in charity shops. Go on. Charity shops. Also, I mean, I, I do go to proper record shops as well. You know, I kind of, and I think kind of, I'm not, I don't think I'm what you'd call or what people would call a crate digger. You know, I kind of, I sometimes I'm quite happy to pay someone else to have done the digging for me first and sort out right. stuff and sort of, you know, and just sort of go, go, go from sort of, you know, record shop to record shop. So yeah. How many I've records got, have you got? Have you got any idea? Oh, I've, I've not, I've really not counted them. But rough, I mean, roughly. Is it, I, mean, it's, I, mean, it's, I mean, how many, it's kind of, I suppose, how many are in those little squares? That's about, yeah, I don't know. it's probably about 3,000. So I mean, not, you know, how many, how many have you got, Dave? Do you think? I have no idea. Yeah, exactly. I, I really you have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I've no, never, if you can count them, you haven't got that many. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's I'd as rather, simple yeah, as that. Not, I'd rather not know. How, yeah. how many yeah. do you get a week? How many new ones? I mean, oh, old, I mean old ones, whatever, will found, find their way to you in an average week. Um, in terms of stuff I get sent or stuff I buy? Well, no, they, well, uh, you, the stuff you buy, probably. Yeah. I would probably say about it would average out like a sort of a record a day. Right. <laughs> so, so, that's a habit. That's yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. serious. so, what have you bought? What yeah. have you got this week? Have you got got Tell us what you've got this week. Uh, I'd like to take a walk come. over to my. Go on. Yeah, you can have a walk. On. Come I'd on. Do, do, do this live. Danny Baker's but, golf cart and uh, yeah, yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, 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 over yeah. to yeah, we'll send a search party if you're if you're not back in a certain amount of time. Is yeah. uh, he, he's disappeared out of shot? He's gone in there. Uh, he's gone past artists L to uh, L to M. Um, yeah, he's, he's he's thinking to himself that great conundrum is, is Captain Beefheart. Is there you go, Captain Beefheart. Is it C or B? Yeah, I mean, there you go. We got to ask that question when he comes these back. Things actually, that us. Um, I love Danny's I golf cart concept. I mean, is it is, is there a, is there a, is there a real golf cart? No, no. Oh, no it's, I, it's a complete, it's a complete yeah. I've seen Danny's. Um, I like the idea of it. Kind of, yeah. It's it's kind of the the, the golf cart is metaphorical. It's it, yeah, is. it is. It is. Yeah. It is. So yeah. what have you got? What have you got? Come well, on. I couldn't find them all. So the only thing I've got is this is a charity oh, shop. Oh, the idea. This is uh, wow. Horse wagon. Wagon. This is the oh, third. Brilliant. He he did three concept albums about um, this uh, guy called Skid Row Joe, who is oh, uh, so is a, a drunkard. So all the songs are about alcoholism and drunks. And he basically did a series of concept albums based solely around this character called Skid Row Joe. So when did that record come out and how did you acquire it? That's 1968 RCA. Okay, right. That, that was via Discogs, that was, yeah. Right, okay, so you bought it on the kind of collector's market, yeah. yeah with, a re right. with a record like that, it, how much, I mean, that's... You, you say collector's market, but not expensive. I mean, kind of in the sense that we were talking about 
records that have gone up in value and records that have right. and records that no one really wants. Not many people are collecting what, what Porter, Porter Wagner. Wagner. <laughs> no, I suppose that's fair. <laughs> so, so if you got Porter Wagner, that record, how much of it is a kind of conversation piece value? Because it's kind of interesting. Porter Wagner made concept records about Skid Row Joe or whatever. Yeah. Well, how much of it is? Oh, I'm going to listen to that a couple of times. Oh. I love Port Wagoner. Port Wagoner. Oh, okay. Best, yeah, I mean, kind of as a, as a storytelling songwriter and the fantastic arrangements. No, I mean, I don't. I'm not. I mean, I kind of grew up in that age of kind of where you'd buy stuff ironically from charity shops because I kind of remember the whole kind of easy listening craze and everything. You know. Oh, yeah, right. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I certainly kind of came up sort of. That's how I uh, probably how I started buying what kind of things. Give us some examples. Of you that. know, like kind of. Um, like the Mandingo album or something. Oh, right, like yes. Yeah. yeah. So you'd, yeah, find, it. <laughs> you'd find it at a charity shop, but you'd actually be quite impressed by the quality of it. It's this kind of, you know, ridiculous kind of Afro fusion record. So that's probably <laughs> how I sort of first started investigating charity shops. But the idea of kind of, oh, this is so bad, it's good. Or, no, I wasn't, yeah. No, I was, that's yeah. different. But, no, but there's also like, got that thing where you buy things because the sleeves are so fabulous. Well, that's that's a particularly fabulous sleeve. The one I would you buy. Know. I would certainly buy something if you know if this looked like something I needed to hear, and the, and the, and it had a fantastic sleeve. Yeah, because sometimes you have no way of checking in the shop what it's yeah. like. So, um, but I had to, so have you got anything else you got you acquired recently? I'm I'm oh, sorry, I'm fascinated. By I this. love all this. Oh, stuff. I got this yeah. recently. Oh wow, what's that? Which is oh, uh, friends and neighbors, Ornette Coleman. Oh, okay. Absolutely fantastic. Which is kind of it's he did it is it's sort of loft recording, and it's kind of it's got kids on it singing along with him on the title track, "Friends and Neighbors," which is wonderful. It's Flying Dutchman. Label. Was that was it on that Kalman Mark that I was complaining to you about having having tried to find his record in uh, in a record shop in Charing Cross oh, Road? God, it and was, God, and, and I went through the whole. I went to a jazz oh, record brilliant. shop. I was looking for this on that record. And I went through everywhere. I looked and I, I, I said what I always say in record shops when I go to the counter, which is because I used to work at a record shop. So it's an admission of defeat on my part if yeah. I can't find a record. I always say, sorry, I may be being stupid, but I can't find Ornette Coleman. And he said, don't have on guard. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. I thought that well, is it, so much the jazz shop it, mindset. He wouldn't have said it then that yeah. friendly away. It slightly harder. Obviously, avant-garde, yeah. you know. I mean, come, come <laughs> on. We're, just, we're, not here to, feel terrible. we're not here to bring people together with music. We're here to keep them as far away as we possibly can. <laughs> put, keep them in their I, place. I mean, it's the interesting thing is like, because I had a, a day out sort of around the record shops the other the other weekend, and it's Every record shop is different. You know, some will be incredibly accommodating and friendly and others will still be kind of, you know, rude and uninteresting. Did you ever go to um, Haggle Vinyl? Do you remember Haggle? Oh, no, I don't think Where I Where was that? that one. Go on. <laughs> In North London. It was famous. It was like, it was run by a guy called Lynn and it was famous in London for being the just the rudest, most unfriendly, overpriced shop wow. ever. You'd only go there as a kind of a... A last, last resort. Last really? Resort. Yeah. So whereabouts the was that? Take, they never been to the record it, and take um, it was, oh, well, it would have been Islington way. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. God, and, um, I he there. famously, um, he famously ripped me off. I kind of bought some records there and I, and I said, oh, you know, can I leave a deposit for these and come back for them next week? You know, and um, and then came back and, and they weren't there and he denied all knowledge of the deposit. And they were too... Um, Nick Jones albums. Oh, right. Yeah. That's serious. Absolutely. So it was to the Devil a Stranger and uh, the Noah's Ark. Um, is it Noah's Ark act? And so it was like, you know, that was a really big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you've forgiven him. That's the main thing. Sorry? <laughs> No, he's going to get back to him if he's still around. The thing is, no one forgave. No one forgave Lynn when he died. Which he, I mean, he died right. about five years ago. Like there were no kind of bit trees about him. Everyone no. was like, just like good riddance to the man. He ra <laughs> he ran a record shop. That's he owes all me. I need to yeah. say. Well, past exactly. thirty. Yeah, uh, exactly. Who were we talking to? Was it Will Hodgkinson? Hodgkinson, who was saying that when he went to buy a Dickies record when he was about eight years old or something. First time in a record shop, yeah. you know. 
As for a dinkage record, and the guy goes, "New one or the old one?" New one. Or the old one? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of saying, "How fantastic to see how old are you?" You know, like you with your Captain B fan or it was. Yeah. You know, yeah. not as none of it just already made to feel really terrible. It yeah. can be so brutal, can't it? I know. So, so, do you do you travel far and wide to find uh, to go record shopping? No, I don't. I mean, I've got a dog, and um, it kind of so she present prevents me from like going oh, right. and, <laughs> and traveling long ways. So, no, I mean, kind of, you know, I I'm not. I don't think, even though kind of you might look at the collection and go, oh, he's a record collector. He's serious about it. I mean, I follow people on Twitter who just, it's their life. It's all. Oh, I'm sure. sure. And they're posting every day of having been to some record shop in Yorkshire or some charity shop in Wolverhampton. And look what I found. And, you know, it's kind of, that's, that's not me. It's kind of, it's not, it can't be my life. It's not my life. You know, you see, it fascinates me because, um, this didn't used to exist. I when there were like, loads of records, yeah, nobody did this <laughs> ever. Yeah. I never, I never met anybody who say, "Do you know? I've been trying to find." You know, yeah. I was having yeah. exactly this conversation recently with a friend, and they were saying, like, kind of, you know, the because her, her dad's a musician. He said, she said, yeah, he's, you know, he's got a lot of records, but he's not kind of. Oh, I've been, you know, questing for this. It's kind yeah, of, it's 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 totally changed. So, do you not buy? vinyl records anymore than dave it's like uh, I, that yeah. collection that stopped at a certain oh time. these are yeah these are yeah i mean i've got millions of cds over there these are these are just you know re- records that you know i will have acquired mainly up till i don't know the mid 80s or something yeah. like that that's when the cd started arriving yeah. um and the thing I buy more than anything else nowadays is CDs, actually. Well, um, not there to an all, are you, Dave? Looking at eBay, thinking there's the kind of Jonathan Richmond album that, 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 that got away. You, you're not that kind of obsessive about it, are you? No, I'm not. I mean, I do. I mean, I do have some quite rare records, but only I'm not kind of, you know, I won't pay silly money for things and kind of. But then what's suppose, silly? What's silly uh, money? Go on. Question, yeah, because um, we I was having a conversation recently because we were talking about like what's probably the most valuable record you own, and this is probably mine. And I paid what well, somebody might consider silly money. I paid sixty pounds for it when I mm. saw it in um, record and music and video exchange. But it's probably worth between 500 and a grand now, unsigned, and mine is signed. So that's probably the, the most valuable. Go on, let's see it. Well, come on, man. This is the <laughs> tension. Is all, oh, my goodness me. It's the Bill Fay out, the first Bill Fay out. Oh, right. Okay. okay. And I was the first person to interview him when he made his comeback. He doesn't really do many face-to-face interviews. So I took it along and I got it. I got it signed. All right. And it says... Thanks for feeling for the music, Andrew. Very best, Bill. So, what label was that on? That's on uh, DRAM. No, it is DRAM, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So that's is that nineteen seventy one. Nineteen seventy. Yeah. Oh, okay. 70. And um, that's his first album. The, the one he made after that time, time of the last persecution, is nineteen seventy one. Well, oh, okay, that's a great cover. That's Jim Irv. I've got Jim Irvin to thank for that because he. <laughs> reviewed the cd it got both records got reissued by c for miles around about yeah 2001 2002 and he reviewed it and bill wrote him a letter to say thanks thanks very much for the review and i remember reading um jim jim's review and just thinking this sounds amazing and so when i saw it i saw it on the wall in um music and video a couple of years later and thought I've got to have that. And the other record, the other album was there next to it, but that was over a hundred pounds. So I'm I'm not going to pay over a hundred pounds for a record. And that now sells for upwards of two grand. So yeah, it's just insane, isn't it? It's just ridiculous. It is. is, And it's only going to get, there's only going to be more of it, isn't there? People are going to pay more and more. I was talking to someone who has a theory that it was the, um, it was the Russian oligarchs that started it. Because it's quite topical, isn't it? And uh, I suppose it, in what way? Because they, I was this guy runs. I won't mention him by name because it might might make him sound like he's a crackpot. But um, he was. He's got a massive collection. He's got like the first hundred 
Blue Note albums, first original pressing of them all and everything. And I was saying, uh, you know, you uh, you carry on buying them. He says, I can't. He says, basically, um, it, it became a way to invest in something that would be known to increase in price, Blue Note records, but also a way to launder money, mm. you know, as well. So it became a way to sort of, you know, invest in something with dirty money. And so he said, the Rus- you know, basically Russians are buying up mint unplayed copies of everything, but they're playing, paying over the, over the odds for them. And it's pushing up the mean price of records so that's how sort of discogs works that's a fantastic yeah. thing isn't it yeah that's how discogs work <coughs> but it kind of people this, look at this money price. finishing up in armament somewhere you know bottom yeah. price I, I mean I, it, yeah. might, it might be lunacy this theory it might be utter lunacy but i was listening like, this this sounds really convincing i'm really convinced by this theory that the the you know that russia once again has been found you know to be kind of the the evil at the root of it all god I'm amazed this stuff never turns up on Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. You know, people, I, people turn up with stuff and... and, and well, they and turn they, up with they artifacts. £75. Pounds. Yeah. Antiques Roadshow famously had the backdrop from the Live Aid studio. Oh, yeah, that's that true. you would in, uh, interview Bob Geldof in front of. I can't, I can't remember what it, I don't know what it was priced at, but, but yeah. nobody actually turns up with records, do they? Um, it's just very, a, very rare, very rarely. And I wonder, I wonder why that is. It's just because, or if they do, they turn up with Beatles records, which I think they think. Or yes, they yeah, that's right. You think oh, these yeah. must be pretty rare. Yes. Yeah, so many of these at the time. They're not going to turn up with a <laughs> Unit 4 plus 2 album, are they? <laughs> oh, <laughs> and they expect you know, to get on BBC the, One. <laughs> yeah, or the Human Beast or something like yeah. that. It's <laughs> not going to happen. That, that would be, I've got a Reckless yeah. Eric live album, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You won't go on the tally. <laughs> but I wonder, maybe, you know, because maybe they haven't got someone who's an expert there. So if someone did turn up with the Human Beast album, you know, someone would look like, oh, I don't know what this is, mate. Oh, we're not no, going to. They're, they're really good at Victorian dolls, but this yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no experts on the Human Beast. I'll give you a tenner. <laughs> <laughs> so what are, your, what are your particular kind of um, specialties nowadays? Oh, that's a good yeah. question. Um, when, I, um, when I first rang up Mojo to... Um, basically to ask for a job before I was, before I was working there, before I got a job on the news desk, I kind of, I rang up to pitch for, you know, various features. And I kind of, and I pitched a piece on Watertown by Frank Sinatra. And I kind of, and I ran through all these various different things and I, somebody, and I'm, I've, I've had, I've discussed this with Jim Irvin. I've, I've said, I'm sure it was you, Jim, and he's denied all knowledge of it, but I, someone sort of listens to all these various pitches and said, Hmm. You see, the thing is, at Mojo, is we don't deal in generalists. We're interested in specialists here. You know, so I think I've always been a generalist. I don't right, think I've yeah. Got, I mean, I rewatched uh, the film The Manchurian Candidate recently, and there's a scene where um, Frank Sinatra is going through the list of all the books he reads. And he says, you know, he says, I've just always been interested in, you know, Prussian jurisprudence and the the diseases of sheep and you know and he reels off this list of completely unconnected books and i think i'm like that i don't think there's a general sort of guiding principle i like i like jazz you know i like kind of lots of kind of i like you know noisy rock and roll i like kind of lots of sort of german electronic stuff from the 70s you know but i don't think and i think that's another thing i'm not kind of concentrated in a particular area I'm right, just, and I'm, you're not particularly attracted to little tiny niche things, are you? Obviously. Yeah, you know, I kind of, I, I like, you know, I do like curious little worlds, but I'm not a sort of a specialist in, in any particular. Area. But you like Frank Sinatra's Watertown, mm. but you don't necessarily have all of Frank Sinatra's albums or anything like that. I do. I oh, do you do? Okay. Of, I do have a lot of Frank Sinatra. Oh, right, okay. yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan of Sinatra. Yeah. And also, they're re- they're really easy to pick up. You know, no one's kind of charged no, that's true. Frank Sinatra records. You know, no, but I remember true. there was um, when I started at Mojo. It was just because um, I think Jim was on here recently. Jim Evan talking about how he started buying lots of British jazz records, wasn't he? He was talking mm. about that. And when I started at Mojo, it was just when they um, they were starting to reissue those, and there was starting to be an interest in them, and. Um, and I was kind of, I was really interested in it. And Fred Della was working at Mojo at that time. So I started quizzing Fred on 
British jazz. And, you know, Who knew everything about everything. Well, exactly. Yeah. You know, he did. And he what met a them. Fantastic man. And yeah. he'd been there. And he was probably <laughs> holding her on a battered old plastic bag, which actually had some of their records in it, which he just exactly. bought at lunchtime. And if he hadn't met them, he had a friend called Stan who didn't. Yeah, absolutely. He did. Yeah, he wasn't did. Fred Della, wasn't he the, wasn't he the, Dave, the, the, the Frank Sinatra fan club president? The secretary of the Fran Frank Sinatra he fan club of, of Great Britain. In, in the 1950s, wasn't it? Fred yeah, went to a Frank Sinatra session. He, he went did. to it yeah. yeah, when he played in London. No. Like, yeah, yeah. He, he recorded did. in London. I mean, yeah. So when, um, when Mojo had its first, um, it would have been over his first or second staff Christmas dinner that I've been invited to. And we had a, you know, we had a secret Santa, you know, and the idea was you got the, you got the <laughs> name, <be> Fred. <laughs> you got the name out of the hat and you, you said, well, who, you know, who have you got to buy? And I forget who I had to buy a present for, but Fred got, got, me Sinatra. So, my name. <laughs> so um and everyone had got people you know various comic things or like you know sort of a box of chocolates or a mug with a you know a bum on it or something like you know just ridiculous sorry fred got me this oh wow well. <laughs> this is great. this is this is gonna be good. this is so fred yeah, yeah, god dude. bless him <laughs> fred got me a copy of henry louther's child song oh from his, from his own collection Oh, gave it to me. Oh, that's so the, sweet. One of the rarest British is, jazz. Is it really? Is it rare? Distance. Have a look, have a look on have a look when you at the end of this about how much people will pay for a copy of wow. Henry Love's child song. And it's and the other thing <laughs> and he is, gave you that, that he just gave you that for the for the Secret Santa. For the Secret Bless Santa. Him. Oh, that was Fred's present to me for Secret Santa. That is so good. Fred, well, I remember when, when Fred used to do the uh, used to do the, the crossword at Smash Earth. And uh, he used to just come in. And whenever he came in, he always brought something with him. Yeah. And I remember when, um, I can't remember when, when it must have been the early 80s when people started to do picture discs and things like that where they had nobody had done them for it for years you know what I mean? and, and, but as far as we were concerned it was all new it was all novel and and fred just turned up with and he had a copy he got out of his bag he had a copy of diner doors swinging doors <laughs> you, remember, you ever see that thing where the cover just folds out and it's colored vinyl and so forth everything that ever happened in pop music had happened 10 years earlier, and yeah. Fred had it. And Fred could prove it. It's That's absolutely yeah. every case. I'm pretty sure. Because he was older than everybody else. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't there a time when there were literally like two pages in Mojo that were just devoted to stuff that Fred had? <laughs> so probably I, I, I think they were. They were. And, well, yeah. I loved it. When we were at Smash Hits, Fred would be reviewing the singles, and it would be kind of um you know, the angelic upstarts or whatever would be single of the week. And you think Fred was actually 52 years old at the time, you know. <laughs> I know. Like, and he'd write about absolutely everything. It was it, great because, like, NME would send him along to, like, interview Sonic Youth and things, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just, it was fantastic, yeah. No, he was absolutely <laughs> lovely, and he knew that I liked crooners. He knew that, because he knew that All I liked right. Sinatra, but he knew that I was interested in kind of, the you know, the lesser crooners kind of. All right, go on. Yeah. And, and just so would bring it in, you know, he'd sort of say, have you, you know, have you heard, heard of this? Have you heard of June Christie? Have you, you know, you're like, oh, June Christie. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, he would just, he just turn me on to all this absolutely fantastic stuff because, you know, not wishing to sort of denigrate anyone else in, in Mojo. Certainly there was a certain point where I was the only one in the office who was interested in Fred's crooner's collection, you know, so, and we would, but he would, if he, he would also take you out for high tea as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where, where did he take you? Well, I never took, had that privilege. Go he, took, um, he took the, he took the women like he took, cause I know Jenny Bully, he was the reviews editor and the picture editor. He would take them to the Savoy for high tea. Wow. Yeah. Right. And um, I remember kind of, he, he took me. What to, is, I, high I, tea? I is that Welsh it. rabbit or is that, the, <laughs> is that cupcakes? What is that? <laughs> It was, but it was, yeah, it was, I mean, he was, yeah, he was, as you say, he was from another age. He was yeah, yeah, yeah. His age. He was. Absolutely, absolutely lovely, man. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So the way we, we normally, um, we normally finish these chats is asking people, <laughs> I fear asking you this question, what is the greatest record ever made? Well, 
It's interesting. Are you going to answer that? You in know any... the answer, right? I knew, I knew, obviously, I knew you'd ask you that question. <laughs> so um, I think I was trying to think about it. What what kind of defines the greatest record ever made? And I think it's a record that makes me feel euphoric. And again, something that kind of does something to me that isn't, I can't break it down into the component parts of, of the sound of the record. And it's not about its historical importance and it's not about anything dry or academic. It's just about... No, it's got to be a personal thing. Yeah, it's just about its feeling and certainly its feeling to me at the time. And so... I kind of, yeah, we'll go, we'll go backwards. Probably the most, what well, I think I've chosen three and we'll end on one. That's which, good. No, uh, that's good. Which is the greatest record of all time. So I've chosen, um, I've chosen, I can hear music by the beach boys is the first one. Oh, and, the, okay. and the reason for that, so the first reason for that is because certainly the first half of it just does something to me in terms of its uplift and it's kind of glory. But I also think there's something quite, tragic at the heart of it because obviously it's it's carl wilson and the beach boys and not brian covering a phil Spector song this is this is the ronettes isn't it i can hear music originally and brian always wanted to make his records you know sound like or or, or the goal to be that they sound like or better than a phil Spector record and the one beach boys record where they take a phil Spector record and it wipes the floor with the Ronettes version is a version a bit a, a version of the beach was where Brian isn't in yes. the it's, it's a Carl it's a Carl Wilson production and it's just you know I because I went back and I listened to the Ronettes version I said it's nice it's a nice song it's fine but the Beach Boys song is and there's something brilliant about that they were you know because obviously they didn't have Brian so they're desperate to make these records sound like they're still Brian records so in a way, it's a kind of ersatz Brian Wilson song, right, but right. in a cert on a certain level, achieves or or you know succeeds in creating what he was trying to create. So it's not it's not you know it doesn't fit into that authored idea of the Beach Boys of Brian Wilson as a genius. Yes. It's the rest of them coming together and trying to do what he did, yeah. and in many ways, kind of creating something that he could never quite do. It's, it's glorious. It's very good. I should go and listen to that. Yeah, that's a really, a really interesting selection. So what's number two? Number two is Temptation so, by New right, Order. New Order, oh, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And that that space, I remember I would, I would go over to Liverpool Library to revise for my um, A-levels. And I remember coming home one night and kind of seeing all the, the people who I'd been at school with, they were all in the pub next to the station. I could see them all. Out. It, was, it was a summer's night. They were outside and I was kind of coming home and I had my Walkman and I was kind of feeling a little kind of like I'm this nerd who just goes to the library and everyone else is in the pub drinking underage and having a fantastic time. And I put, I this came on on the Walkman and just, I just felt like, I was walking home on clouds. I just felt utterly wonderful. And it sounded to me, I'd never had a girlfriend at that point and I'd never been in love. And it sounded to me like what all those things would feel like, which is what pop music is meant to oh, do. That's yeah, yeah, it is. Goals of pop music. And again, you know, kind of, because they re-recorded it. They re-recorded this because the they hated the way that the synth sound on it, that it sound, they sound quite clunky, I think, to Bernard's ears. So there's something, in their mind, there's something flawed about it. And yet that flawed nature is kind of what makes it for me. I think it's just, you know, that there's a naivety to it, which also goes with this idea of what a teenage boy thinks of his love, you know. It, it's mm. funny, it's funny, the, this thing about records, that I, I was thinking about this recently. Every single record, without exception, the person who made it kind of hates it. Yeah. You know, because they know, well, oh, they didn't feel right that day or they were flat that day. Oh, it's God, I was in that line. Was, yeah. And that none of that matters to anybody no. who listened to it at all, ever. Well, and, 
And sometimes those are the things that make it. It's that little <laughs> crack in the voice when the, the things that's the bit you hear that's the bit that gives it a certain humanity or something but it's, also, yeah. it's a gold rule about any form of entertainment i think is the thing that people find your greatest weakness is also your greatest strength isn't it it's the thing that you that you beat yourself up about it's probably what people like about whatever you do you know that's that applies to singers or anything yeah it's like if you're a writer the things where you go oh God, I've done that again. I do. Why do I always put that in my writing and put that in my books? Because well? that's you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And someone who's reading it's going, oh, I like it when Dave makes that. Yes. I like yes. it when no, I like it when that happens in Andrew's yeah. writing. Yeah. And yeah, you're just fun. saying, you know, God, you idiot, you know. And, yeah, it's funny. It's, it's funny. So yeah. true. It's so, it used to be like that with magazines that, you know, people would say that they loved a certain part of the magazine. And it'd be the thing that you'd, Give them the least amount of thought. Yeah, absolutely. Really, well, just yeah, something knocked off in 10 minutes. minutes. Whereas the thing you'd all been agonising over and just really thought was sensational, everyone had just turned the page. You just, yeah, yeah. Your association with it is completely different when you make so, it. So what's, what is number the, one? What, what, what's number one? Well, this is, again, it's kind of, it's linked. My brother, um, again, it comes back to my brother. My brother used to, um, he used to buy old jukebox singles off a market in Liverpool, you know, sort of with the, the centres out. And he used to buy them cheap. And he'd been, I think he'd been out to some party. So he came home in the morning and he did, he obviously bought these singles. Obviously he probably had taken them to a party to play at the party. And then he'd come home sort of early in the morning. So I was, st I was still in bed. So he probably got home, probably still half cut, because obviously he wouldn't have thought otherwise, why would he play these records in the morning when everyone was still in bed? And he put this record on, and I heard it. I basically felt like the sound was coming up the stairs to oh, me. Right. Um, it's, produced by, it's produced by Lou Adler, and no one, no one thinks of this as the greatest song ever. And people think of it as a novelty song and a, and a piece of cheese. But, and it's got, also got the best key change in, I think, of any song I've ever heard. And it's Scott McKenzie's San Francisco. Oh, oh right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, just yeah. because it's got those bells and chimes at the start, I love records with bells and chimes. Right. It's got those bells and chimes at the start. And they're what came up the stairs as I was in bed. I heard this like ching, 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 you know, almost like Christmas morning kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. It is a, that's a truly the, fantastic the reverb record. on his voice. It sounds enormous, yeah. that record. It sounds absolutely enormous. But then there's that bit where you think you know where it's going, and then it goes into that key change where he sings, "Yeah, that's yeah, right. the end, yeah, yeah, San Francisco." And I've never, I think I've always loved a good key change after that, and I think that was my yeah. first. Um, yeah, the other great one is Penny Lane. Yeah, just but, that yeah. final lift. You think it can't get any better? Exactly. But I think because I'll always, you know, I'll always associate with that moment. I think that's it. I think in a way, it's important that your great greatest record of all time should be yours so there should be something attached to it that is no, no, it's true, you're right. yeah but you know no one else has got that memory or has got you know has got that element of it so it's yeah. it's utterly yours yeah. yeah it's that and i think and it's also you know it, i'm quite safe in the knowledge that no one else would have that in their <laughs> great record of all time and that doesn't oh matter. i don't know that's a that's a brilliant record I yeah i remember it being on the radio at the time. well it's not a very although to be fair it's not a very celebrated record it doesn't yeah. pop up in the, no. the people people do top hundreds it doesn't get in there i wouldn't have yeah. thought so I thought I thought you were going to say celebratory there, which is another thing that I like. If you talk about what kind of music do I like, and I like melancholy music. I like happy music un undercut with melancholy. You know, right, I like right. the I like the black notes. You know, in there. Yeah, you know? yeah. And there's a yeah. kind of there's a sense that this summer of love in San Francisco isn't going to last very long. Yeah, absolutely. No, because by the time they've made a record about it, it's yeah. really got to be over. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But there's already sort of something autumnal in the air about it. Yes, there yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, which I love as well. Yeah. It's also I such a funny lyric, I think. Naive. If you're going to San Francisco, so be sure to wear some flowers in your hair. It's an yeah. extraordinary yeah. idea that we might all be going to San Francisco. Exactly. If you, are, also, if you are, I've got a piece of advice for you. But at the same time, <laughs> we may not. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, if you are, but then you yeah. may not. You may just you know stay in Bolton. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know. See how you get on with flowers in your hair there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It like, may not fly. It's anyway. great because it's also like I like records that are like pieces of advice as well. It is like a checklist, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, don't San Francisco. Yeah. Flowers in my hair. You know. Yeah, that's right. Oh, <laughs> all those yeah. 
Very, very good. Yeah, very no, that's good. been brilliant. That was that's really good. Lovely. Oh, thank that's you, fun. guys. I've absolutely loved it. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, or... don't worry. That's really, what we really want. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.